Hi, I'm Marie. And I'm Kimberly. We are here in the Living Felt Studios. Kimberly is a Kimberly Saar of Saar Design. You've seen her on Etsy. You've seen her in our school with her fantastic Busy Elves class. I know many of you have taken her class and she's been in the studio this week filming a brand new tutorial of needle felting extreme faces. And while she was here, Kimberly and I have been chatting about the importance of needle felting in 3D yes. very firmly. We both find a lot of value in it, and we thought that we would pause and just share some tech tips with you first around the value of needle felting really firmly, and then how we both get there. Yeah, I think that that is a very important part of getting a quality piece and it makes a difference in so many different ways, don't you think? Yes, absolutely true. And I know a lot of people ask about that, how firm should something be? So we'll look at the firmness test. Jordan's come up with some really, a great way for us to measure it. We have some little um, examples. Now, actually your example, you call it being as firm as a tennis ball. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about that. Well, it feels about the same, and maybe part of it's because it is furry, like a tennis ball, but right. it has that same kind of resistance. You can push in on it. It's right. not a rock. Right. But when you push, when you let go, it goes back to where it was. It goes back to the shape it was. Yeah, and we both, so we brought in with us a few things from around the shop, things that I've made, things mm -hmm. that Kimberly has made, and even some things made by other teachers in the school. So we can talk a little bit about why that firmness is so important. And one of the things that we both said that is really helpful when a piece is firm is the longevity, its ability to hold up over time. Definitely. I think um, if it's soft, it's going to get snagged on things. It's going to get pilly. It's mm -hmm. going to be harder to clean. So if it's going to be handled year after year and you want it to last, you definitely need it to be nice and hard and dense. Right. So this, you know, you might have something that's a Christmas ornament. Mm -hmm. You might have something that you want your kids or grandkids to play with. Yes. Right. Yes. Something that you expect people will pick up. Maybe even you're doing shows and you're selling your pieces at shows and people are going to handle them all the time. Absolutely. If they're not firm, then what happens, I think, is that the outer coat, whether it's furry or flat, always stays a bit loose, don't you Yes, think? and it starts to just look kind of worn out, you know? Yeah, worn out over time. So one of the first things we say is, if you want your piece to last a long time, then go for a nice firmness. Well, what else is really important to you for why you like to make your pieces really firm? I think it really holds up well to detail when you're putting a face on or a color on top. You really need that firmness so that you don't have unexpected results where things start to cave in on one side and they That's get right. asymmetrical and wonky. You, you want that solid workspace. Right. We were talking about that yesterday in relation to 2D as well as 3D. So if mm -hmm. you're doing something like this and you were to be caving out eye holes or eye sockets or a mouth or something, then the more you press in, the more you lose the surface area that you were planning your face yes, on. Yes, and it changes shape too. That's right. Like it, if you're trying to keep this crescent shape or some other kind of shape, if it's soft and you're working in on it, it's going to start to come in on itself and deform. alter. Yeah. Yeah. It deform. So if you can start with a really firm foundation, then that's going to support adding detail, whether you're building up to add detail because it's got to receive all the additions that you're putting Absolutely. on top or whether you're trying to carve out a space to insert something. Which is a little or, counterintuitive because you're thinking, well, if I'm carving in, don't I want it to be soft? Right. Well, and there's a medium there somewhere. You know, If it's too hard, you can't carve in. But yes, you need it to be not just solid, but you need it to be uniform. Right. The That's density right. to be uniform all the way around. That's right really is going to support adding that detail. And something else that we both really appreciate is when a piece is really firm, then it allows you to get a smoother outer surface. Definitely. Right? That's the big one, I think. Yeah, we both feel like if you, and I know other, other people feel this way as well. And I've had people say, oh, Maria, you know, I like my mushrooms to be squishy or things should be sure. squishy. And I, I totally understand that. Yeah. But we also get the question all the time about how do I get rid of holes? Or they people have said that their fur is pulling out yes. as something that they've made. Yes. And if you can get that understructure really firm, then you can get a really secure attachment of a longer fiber. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then nice what and about tight. the smoothness of the outer? 
Well, it's the same thing. If you have these soft pockets and holes, you know, it's never going to look smooth. So you right. need that. You have to have the under base has to be nice and smooth and uniform if you want your top coat to be. Because right. if you try to just do it in the end, it never really comes out the way that you right. think it's going to. And now Kimberly and I both really like to exist in, I think, a, a playful fantasy <laughs> realm. Like, Can you tell? Yeah, she likes <laughs> humor in her art, which is one of the reasons I find her art so endearing because I like humor and playfulness in, in my art too. But it doesn't matter whether what you're doing is playful, fun fantasy or more realistic like some of these other artists. These other artists, when they come in, they're putting a lot of density to their pieces so that something like this really becomes a gallery piece yes. or a lifelong treasure Incredible. of a family, right? Because it is like an art piece. It's going to last a long time and I think even be more respected because Absolutely. it's so well made. Yes, I mean, it's a sculpture, right? It, right. And that's, that's the mentality I have is this is a sculpture and I want it to maintain its shape and and stay the way that I formed it and posed it and not have it change and wilt and you right. know, deform over time. Mm -hmm. And like this elephant's trunk, we were looking at this elephant's Amazing. trunk. Isn't it gorgeous? And in order to get all of this detail into the trunk, this was made by Irina Hughes. Uh, she This trunk has to be really firm Solid. to be able to receive such detailed compaction Absolutely. right in the in the fiber. And this is made by Esther Baba. Both of these are classes in the school, as are Kimberly's elves and will be her uh, extreme faces or something. We'll call it something, something like extreme that. Extreme faces, yeah. I think, yeah. yes. Yeah, very fun. <laughs> So what we would like to do is share with you how we each build up our pieces to be nice and firm with really feels like minimal effort or minimal strain. It yes. takes time, but time, it doesn't have to be painful. But you don't have to give yourself, you know, carpal tunnel. <laughs> right. Here, here or or yeah. there. Yeah, that elbow. Right. And whether <laughs> you're doing something large or small or small or large, we have the same approach. There's two kind of different approaches. One is if something is pretty much round, mm -hmm. right? And then if something might have a center armature, like something that's yes. more oval shaped or long or tall. Yes. Right? So we're going to look at that together. To demonstrate, we thought we would start with doing just a round 3D shape. So if anything that's going to be perfectly round, this is just two ways out of maybe the many ways you can approach it to create a really firm core. Kimberly, do you yes. want to kick us off and yeah. show us how you would do it? Well, I think sometimes when, if you're making a, a big shape or a big ball, it's tempting to start with a big piece of wool, right? Uh, yes. And that, I think, is a mistake. Mm -hmm. You're right. The, there's a tendency to want to start with a really big shape, but what happens is there's too much air in there. Exactly. And so I... Th I equate it with like trying to create mashed potatoes with an ice pick. Yes, you have to because start it, small. Yeah, you have to start small. You have to get that compression in in the first place and the best ways to get all the air out. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is already kind of big, but what's one thing, one trick I like to do is before I even start rolling it up into a ball, which yeah. is also your tendency to want to uh -huh. do, is I like to take and start felting this piece into felt before I roll it up. Very you know, interesting. And give it that density right from the start get the air out of it right from the start that is a really great approach so you start with a very short yes length of fiber maybe half the thickness of our core wool roving exactly and then you're just getting all of the air out and compacting the fibers to kick it off precisely nice and you can get a lot of the air out when you roll it but sometimes this helps me with that process to make it just a little quicker and cleaner. And you can do as much of that as you want first. Uh huh. But then I would just start rolling a really tight roll and you can bring these ends in cause they're not right. as tight and just keep doing that with the roll and tuck. Yeah. From this point forward, your method and my method for starting with a little firm foundation are mm -hmm. the same. That does not surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> Now you got to hold on to the tension here, you right? Do. You, you can't let go. You have to. And then before you even start to let go, get some good pokes in there right? so that it stays where you rolled it. And then obviously if you're doing a ball, you're going to want to come this way and shorten that up. But that's just a really good way to start off 
getting a solid foundation, I think. How do you do it? I really like that. Well, my method is is similar and I see that you're using fine, you've chosen to use fine needles. Always. And yes, I always do. Sometimes I will and sometimes I'll start a shape with something like, I really like the 38 star spiral, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but like you, um, I'm going to start with a thin strip of fiber. Okay. Don't know why 18 inches is kind of like my fave of flake. your go-to. Right. And I will always start from right here and I like this wow pad because it's really dense and it doesn't give yes so then i'm going to start my roll right here and i'm going to make a tight tube just like you did Mm -hmm. but i'm going to roll and tuck and roll and tuck just from right here so i am pinching and rolling and doing uh the compression from the loose fiber yes just right there and what i like to do is if i feel like it's gonna kind of get away from me is i'll start poking it right here absolutely and you don't have to use a, a coarse needle but you can I mean, it's an option to use a coarse needle right at this beginning. So all I really want to do is tack it down as I'm on my way. And Mm -hmm. I think, you know, like kind of where we're starting here with these little small beads is a really important place to start. Absolutely. You, if I like to poke as I go and just kind of get those fibers to all hold together. Yes. But one of my favorite compaction tools has actually become the cluster of my 42 triangles. Nice. Even in this stage or like when I'm shaping. Mm-hmm. Because the barbs are so close to the end of the needles and they don't really need to go in very far if you have that compression and if you needle felt as you go in the layers. But what I do notice is that, you know, when you get to this end is really, you just want to bring that little tail around, right? And tack it down. So just the same as you, I think, but I like your method of compacting in the beginning. And I'm probably going to try that. Probably going to try that to start. The thing I like about this is I think you and I both start the same way, and that is with a very small, dense Mm -hmm. shape. And then even if we're going big, we want to build up from that small, dense core. Especially if you're going big, I think. Right. And I think a really great way for people to practice their firmness would be to start making these small shapes. Like we said, maybe doing some needle felted acorns or Mm -hmm. little needle felted beads. 100%. Just start very, very small. Because if you can make a small dense shape, then you can make a bigger dense shape. Yes, and you just do it a little bit at a time. I think that's part of what I do too, is I never add too much fiber at once because I find it it very difficult then to get back. Right, you're asking the needle to pass through too much air. Yes. If you put big lofty amounts on rather than little layers and tack them down as you go. Mm Mm-hmm, agreed. Now, where do you go from here? Do you just do more of the same From here, yeah, so from here, once I have my shape round, like I'm not going to let it go until, meaning I'm not going to move on until it's perfectly round, Mm -hmm. then I'm just going to do a series of small, thin layers and tack it down with the fine needles as I go. Yeah, I do the same thing. Well, I get, because of the way that I roll it, I tend to start, mine's a little bit more of a cylinder than a ball. Oh, interesting. So then I will often come back in the opposite direction. Right. Just to to make it more round so that it's not that is what happens to me over time. Yeah. Like as I add stuff, then you have to go this way, Mm -hmm. this way and that way. Yeah. So I will start wrapping. That's my next step anyway, is I'll start to wrap. Right. And so it's a little bit thicker this time. And now you have something to hold on to. Now that you have that middle, you have something to hold on to. It makes it a little easier. I agree with you. Yeah. I would make it this dense if I'm making a little head. Mm -hmm. Right. My big frogs. Absolutely. Especially with heads, I think, because you need that symmetry of the eyes and everything. And if it's not dense and solid, you're going to get little cave-ins and strange things happening right no matter what you're doing putting something on like a nose or Mm -hmm. carving out your eye sockets or even attaching hair because people really want to root their hair into the head of their doll and if the head isn't secure enough then when they root the hair, either it doesn't stick or it's going to cave in if their needle's too aggressive. You know what it's like? It'd be like trying to frost a cake that wasn't baked all the way. Right. It just come apart on you and it doesn't doesn't really go on nice. That's a great example. 
So you're using the the pen tool. Is that I a am. tool you like to use? I use often? it a lot. Or you can do the little rubber band yeah. method. But getting those, I would rather have three fine needles than one coarse needle. Me I think too. It just works well, a lot. Well, at better. least when I go ahead. So yes. mine is rubber banded too. I just covered That's it so with neat. core wool. I love that. <laughs> I covered it with core wool and then yellow, so that even if I can't see the colors, I you know That's I know so what smart. it is. I'm gonna have to do that now when I go home. With all the needles. <laughs> Yeah, so from here, I'll do the same. Like, I'm going to wrap really tight. And as soon as I attach that first piece of fiber on, mm -hmm. I'm going to tack it down. Like, just so that it's in place. That's really smart. I, I should probably do more of that, like, stabbing as I wrap. Well, at least that way I know I can kind of let go of it. Mm -hmm. But I'll do this same way, like, kind of as we did, and tuck those ends in and roll it. Depending on how round I want it to be. If I want it to be an egg, then yes. I'll, you know, I'll let one end get a little bit bigger than the other. But I do like to at least tack a little as I go so I can manage that shape. That makes sense. But just like you, I like to start with a very firm core mm -hmm. and then have that to compress into. Now, Kimberly, people ask us all the time about holes, and we talked a little bit about it in the beginning, mm -hmm. but I kind of tell people that what they want to do, when they have holes, really what they're seeing is the, it's sort of like the compaction potential of the fiber. Yeah. And so when they have holes, what they really need to think about is that really what they have are bumpy bits and the other fiber needs to be compacted down. Yes. What do you think? I think that's part of the trick is just to not make holes in the first place if that right. makes sense because <laughs> yeah, if yeah. you're starting off solid enough you don't get those little pockets as uh -huh, much right but if you do find you're getting them I think you need a finer needle and you need to go I don't know what do you think you need to go well, around where all the puffy spots are what, and... what I think is that people are asking about holes when they're looking at something like this and sometimes people just don't know and it's maybe that they haven't seen something in person because I've seen a lot of you know samples come in the shop people mm -hmm. are sharing their first things and it might be very loose and squishy and so they'll see these little divots and say I've got holes yeah and I'm saying no what you have is the rest of this wool needs to be compressed down to yeah, the same exactly to the same exactly. level and that's where yeah you could use a fine needle if you have that firm undercore you can just use your fine needles right here to yeah. compact all of that down to the same just level. push it down to right where so think less of getting holes same. and more of compressing your no, fiber you're right, right that is the, the way better down. way to word it because those holes are there because the fiber on top is still too loose too poofy yes yeah absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, most of the time, it's not that their piece is rock hard and they have holes. Right. Most of the time. And if it is, all they have to do is put a top coat on. Fill it a in, A top right? layer. Yeah. Now, we were talking about time. So when you're making a piece, like maybe one of your little um, gourd, gourd faces or gourd yes. people, how much time will you spend to really create the core of that sculpture? Several hours, for sure. Yeah. Um, depending on size, obviously. You're right. But uh, you need a few hours to get to even just a, a small, like an orange size. Yes. You need a few hours right. to build that up, at least for me, for the kind of density that I want. Right, right. So you have yeah. to be patient. You do. It, it requires the intention in the first place to make a really mm -hmm. solid structure that, you know, will last for years and years, especially if people are selling their work. It's important that it be really firm and dense. I agree, especially. So that the quality, the craftsmanship really feels like it's there. And yeah, you well, got to really look. be an heirloom, you know, if you really for sure. make it solid, it, it will last. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. So the intention to do it in the first place and then the patience and the determination to do every poke every that's required to get Absolutely. it Absolutely. I've tried different kinds of shortcuts like, um, you know, using a, a dryer ball or doing oh, right. something like that. But Which it aren't necessarily up, firm in the first no, place. And it just ends up, you end up killing your, your joints on those because they're, they're hard, but they're not... But they're hollow almost. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Like you have to really pound into them to get the fiber to connect, but you still don't have that as solid of a of a base. If that makes sense, I know sense. it's because so of the they way have a they're crunchy made. Crunchy coating or something. They're yeah. kind of banged out, and what happens is it's like a, the the outer layers felt more than the inner because mm -hmm. of the way they're made. I agree. I agree. I always regret it when I try to do a shortcut. I haven't found a good one yet, so I think it's just good old. Uh, elbow grease, I guess, or time, right. really, more than right. elbow grease. Mm -hmm. So in, intention, attention, and patience, really, to get that form, that firm, 
core. Mm -hmm. And then from here, you can just build up your layers and your shapes from something actually very tiny. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm like you, like I might switch from holding my multi needles to just holding a single needle. Yeah. And I don't know what triggers that switch. It's the way it feels. Yeah, it yeah. starts to feel, okay, it's too hard now to get this to go in. So I need a finer needle. It just sort of, I feel. So I kind of have a feeling that you like me, like you don't mind geeking out on this and spending <sighs> hours. Are you kidding? <laughs> I don't even know that the time has gone by and I'm still just poking the same thing. I get lost in it. It's, I know. it's sort of like meditation or something. Uh, yeah. I'll tell Jordan, like I'm working on something for a tutorial and it, it even just making the frogs for example takes mm -hmm. hours, hours just to make that little orange or yeah you know, yes. whatever it takes hours and there's no getting around it no so you've got to take the time and have to like the process i think yeah you do if you if you do it's a lot sweeter yes yeah if you do so we would both start a larger shape the same way yes very small solid foundation yes. even if you're doing something like one of your gourd faces a large doll head 100%. a medium doll head we're gonna start with a small little well first it's really like a of, grape i can't think of anything i wouldn't start small like, like what, what right. is there i, don't know. I think when i first started needle falsing i didn't know that yeah i didn't have that philosophy i had to develop that philosophy like i didn't learn it somewhere. sure i had to develop it over time from wondering why my pieces were squishy when i first started right it, why like, is it very, still doing this yeah, yeah why can't i get it to go and mm -hmm. i had to learn that the compaction happens in the building it's almost it just like with wet felting it's like the way to avoid holes mm -hmm. is to do those even thin layers and i think that this is the same way the way to build up the firmness is that it's all in the building up of the layers. You're right. That's absolutely what it is. Yeah. So if you're making something 3D, round, egg-shaped, kind of, mm -hmm. right, round or egg-shaped, we would both start the same way with a grape. With a grape. <laughs> start it's with always it. a grape. Yeah. I get start excited when I get to the golf ball stage because <laughs> then you can start kind of putting on a little Bigger bit layers. more fiber and you're like, ooh, it's like a snowball. Exactly the snowball effect, right? Exactly. Same thing. Exactly. Beyond making something in like a round, almost spherical shape, both Kimberly and I like to use a simple armature if we're making something a little bit taller. Yes, It definitely. might be something like a gnome, which tends to be a little more conical, or a Christmas tree, torso. Or like a, a fish, like a like yeah. narwhal, or one of these tall... Squashes. Yeah, tall squashes. Anything that's tall. A cactus. a cactus. So anything where you're wanting to get a little bit of height, mm -hmm. we both find it's really helpful to start with some kind of core or inner structure that gives us a middle to head towards, right? And Definitely. something to kind of help define that shape. So we're going to look at how both of us use chenille stems in the inner building of a structure. One of the ways I like to use a chenille stem is not in its, you know, floppy, loosey goosiness like this. I like to make it uh, folded over mm -hmm. so that I have a little more structure. And I often like to leave a little tail that I can hold on to. So especially let's pretend I'm doing a gnome or like one of our fantasy owls. And I like to add twist to it. But I like to leave a little loop here because I'm going to put my fiber in there. So I'm going to twist this. And when I twist, whether I'm doing a harder wire or this loose wire, I create a little V right here and hold it with my fingers. And then I just twist this part so that if you hold it like that, they'll twist evenly. And this will make the chenille stem have more firmness than when it's just by itself. Mm -hmm. I leave this little loop here so that I can put my fiber in it. Whether I'm forming a sphere or a long shape like this, I'm going to pull off a thin strip of my fiber. And especially on these under layers, the thinner the strip of fiber, the more I can control it. The goal is to attach it to that chenille stem very tightly and with as little air as possible. So I'll use this little loop that I've created to kind of hook my fiber through so that now it's held on there. And then you can just ratchet that down. And that gives you just a little starting point, if you will. Oh, that's so, smart. <laughs> so now I'm right-handed, so I tend to hold this with my dominant hand, and I'm going to fold this over, and I like to twist the chenille stem and hold tight to the fiber with this hand. So I'm going to put this on as tightly as possible using these fingers right here to keep all of the air out and hold tension. 
the tighter you wrap it around this under structure, then the less you have to needle felt and the less likely you are to hit it with your felting needle. So I'll stop here just to, we'll just make it this tall. Well, I'm, I don't even need to needle felt it yet. I'm going to go right back over it. So as long as I am holding that tension, keeping all of the air out, then I'm starting to build up that under structure of what could be a gnome, a mini Christmas tree, a taller gnome hat. And at any time I'm willing to fast that flip is. it That's over, great. it builds up pretty quick. And it doesn't have to be all that even to start start because you can always go back and you know fill in the gaps just with the wrapping. But you don't wanna let go until you've tacked it down, <laughs> right? Don't let go. So first needle felt down the tail or that last little bit that you're holding on to and get that locked in place just so that you can let go of the fiber. And really that's it because yes. I'm gonna continue building up this exact shape just by following those same methods, but we'll just start one wrap. Now, if you want this bottom, like let's say this is going to be a little gnome or a Christmas tree and you want the, the bottom to be very flat, mm -hmm. then we need to start just controlling the fiber right there and not mm -hmm. let it stretch all the way down. So after I've done the top and I get the, the top is nice and narrow, in this case, let's say this shape is gonna be narrow as opposed to uniform the mm -hmm. whole way around then I'm gonna start, instead of building at the top, I'll always start building right here where I wanna add more fiber. That's smart. Okay, but I'm still gonna stay thin because the key is really to control the fiber. Don't you think, Kimberly, Absolutely. is that how you work as well? Absolutely. Yeah, you want it to be thin and not twisted. And always, every time I go to add a new piece, just tack it down before you move on. And that way, you don't have to worry about it moving. Slipping on you. Yeah. So now again, but this time we can build up by, again, we're twisting and now that I've got my little handle here, I can twist this around and around and then build my shapes up. But keep the tension and if at any times it feels like it's getting bulky or getting away from you, well just tack it down before you go too far so that you don't leave a bunch of air in there. And if any time you're not happy with your needles, just switch them out. Switch them out and see if there's something else you like better. And right here at the bottom, I always like to go in mm -hmm. and just scoop it up and start to form like a bit of a, a shelf. And then do you, when you, if that's going to be your bottom, would you just cut the I stem do. later? So what I'll yeah. do, here, we'll, I'll, I'll tear this off here. I, I usually won't, I won't tear off. Like I'll just wrap until I'm done, mm -hmm. you know, with a link. Of course. You can dry felt a little bit with your fingers and like things will kind of let, you know, stay yes. laid down once you get that under base on and it'll stay in place. It gives you a little ability to tack it down. Now, not, not all fibers behave that way, right? But like this yes. core wool is, it's really grabs onto itself. And I will continue needle felting this until it's nice and firm in the shape I want. But on this underneath side where Kimberly was talking about, what I'll do is, when I'm ready to clip it is I'll push this with all my strength and then use my snippers in there sure. so that it kind of recedes a I little bit. I have done that exact same thing before. Yes. Right, you want the bottom to be a little more conical, conical, mm -hmm. concave, convex. Which one is it? Depends any. on if it's You want it standing, to be an yeah. any and not an out. Yes. <laughs> if you want it to so stand on stand its own. Up. So Absolutely. you're going to want to control that right there. So how do you use a chenille Well, stem? I actually think you're method there is something I'm definitely going to try and use because I think that that um, is faster and, oh. and um, smarter in oh. a lot of ways. But I do a similar thing. Definitely fold it in half. Definitely twist it because the single too chenille stem is way too wimpy. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just leave two little guys down here. I have just rolled it right over oh. without your cool little trick. So that works as well, but I think your way might work better. Well, similar to when we were wrapping to make the ball. Yeah. You know, I'll just use this, just, just helps you roll it, right? Oh, gotcha. So I have just done it this way in the past, pull it and roll it. 
And I do this a lot when I'm making the taller gourd. So I'll start with something like this. Uh huh. And I love the um, the chenille stem in there it helps you to be able to shape it a little bit too. Like if you want it to kind of curve over yes. that yes. wire helps you get there. Whereas if you're just using wool, that would be hard. It requires more more effort and right. I, yeah, I feel the same way. Like with a gnome hat and stuff, yeah, you can really shape them. And because the wire is in there, I can start with a little bit more fiber than I normally would on a base because it's all clinging to that. Oh, look how uniform that is. That's beautiful. And it's so beautifully uniform. I usually just start there. And you know, people ask about, well, how do you not stab the wire? And I don't I just don't find that it's really an issue, I guess. I'm just kind of going around it. Once in a while you'll feel it stick, but I'm not pushing hard enough that it's gonna break the needle or anything like that. Right. So we're we're only compacting the wool to the middle, like you've heard me say a million mm -hmm. times to the middle, to the middle. And that chenille stem provides the middle. If you don't have it, your needle tends to want to push past that. And yes. it's like you're not really firming up your shape over time. Yes. It just gets it's, weird. It does. It gets lumpy. really weird. Mm -hmm. I, because I agree. you push past the middle, then you're pushing the needle uh, past a I point just, like, through to the other side. And forth and I totally and do and that. Poke and roll. And then, you know, you, if you need it longer, you can obviously add more. It is good to have a little, little bit to yeah. hang on to. Mm -hmm. But this really helps if you're trying to get tall. And I have, when I've needed to make something even taller, I have put chenille stems together. Because you can make a bigger one of these if you need a really long, like yeah. you're going to do a snake or something like yeah. that. You yeah. can totally do it that way. But then you also can still manipulate it because yeah. you have that wire in yeah. there. So I find that to be very helpful. I like that method. And I like that you kind of, like, as you were rolling it, you were drafting it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. drafting and you it could out be poking to... it too as you go if yeah. you wanted to do it that way. But it's already, you know, fairly compact and it will get more so that's okay, fantastic I love, I that, love it I'm gonna try that yeah me too you <laughs> <laughs> good one I like that especially when you're you're not wanting to make it conical mm -hmm. but you know that's really nice and for both of our pieces you know they're not starting out rock hard but you want to get the density before you move on to the next step 100%. really start to get that density before you move on just like we did with the ball so if you're trying to needle felt longer taller shapes right now without a armature in the middle, try starting with the chenille stem, you, either method and, and see how lot. you like it. Yeah. yeah. We do have one other method that we like and we've, we've shared several times and often I'll use this if I'm just making something like a little dome or if you don't want to keep the center in. And really it's just one of the first ways that I learned to, to felt and make shapes without having an armature. And it's using something like, you could use an apple stick, which is a little bit bigger mm -hmm. than this, mm -hmm. or these are like little kebab sticks. I use these so much in felting. You do? For so many things. And what yeah. do you use them well, for? Well, I sometimes use them for legs. Uh -huh, an if armature. You, if you don't right? have complicated legs and you just want it to stand up strong, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I use them as awls. I use yeah. them to <laughs> stick a snowman together. Nice. When you're trying to make the three balls and you I don't want it. to have to build them at the same time, just put right. them on a skewer. Oh, that's so clever. <laughs> I, that's really clever. I'll sew those balls together. Well, right? Yeah, <laughs> I will. But these, you can also use this as sort of a temporary spine or armature, if mm -hmm. you will, while you're working with something. We've done this a lot. My only tip is whenever you're working with these is make sure you have really good kebabs that they don't have loose bits. If they have loose bits, um, like little snags on them, definitely throw them out because they can get snagged on your skin. So just if they're Slivers. if they're fractured, yeah, you don't want to hold on to them. But I would use this just like I used my chenille stem, and that is well, I like to use them especially for things that I'm making conical um, or stubby. You know, so mm -hmm. I'll just start by folding a little bit right over the chenille stem hold your attention as you go, and then wrap. So in this case, I would make, you can use this top taper or you can use this blunt end, whichever you're more comfortable with, and just wrap it around the chenille stem. So let's say I just wanted to make like a, a stubby little, a stubby little Christmas tree, if you will. Mm -hmm. And what I like is that this is so easy to hold on to. Yes. And then you can draft this fiber out as you go. So let's make a mini, mini Christmas tree because you can pull the fiber and then you can just 
end up putting less on the top than you put on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And this can hold such tension for you. If you're having trouble with your core rule breaking, you know, as you're pulling tension, we'll just get your hands a little bit closer and back off the tension a little bit. So we'll pull this off and then you can secure it around the chenille stem and start to shape it and guide it to get it how you want it to be oh, without that. ever even needle felting. Because the tension's already there, so the fibers just want to grab onto themselves. It's like a little cotton candy. Look at you. That's amazing, that. right? And so then I always start needle felting. I'll start with this one actually at the, at the tip so that I can shape it right there. But this shape, just having that really straight stem up the middle just really makes all the difference. That is a great idea. I love that. And sometimes I use this of like, you know, maybe you're just building onto something and you can build your little shape. Like maybe this shape is going to be an add on to something. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Like little... Yes. I've made little um, houses like in the winter scene. I love that um, thing that we did a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And that's a good method for getting those little cylinders. For right. The little buildings. Right. Little domes. Okay, so then you just go right in the bottom. And I like to firm up the bottom before I spend too much time here because if you needle felt this down, you kind of squish it out. Mm -hmm. But if you go into in. the shaft, then what happens is, and especially if you go this way when you're building, whether on the chenille stems or that, then you're compacting the wool this way as well and not just going straight down. Because sometimes things get a little squishy, don't they, if you don't build it up yeah. this way. Yeah. So you, you do want to go along the length of something as well as straight in and that's going to just help build up your density all the way and when i'm working on this notice that my angle is almost always a 45 degree or more shallow 45 30 15 so that you're not going straight in Into there's the no wood, reason that, to that would be yeah you don't want to hit the yeah wood. you're going to bend your needle then you're going to put a you know a bow in it and mm -hmm. it will snap over time so in this way, you actually can get little, tiny, dense shapes. I love that. And I not have it. anything left in the middle. That's great. Right? You could sew through it or attach it in some other way. So then when you're, when you're all done or when you're happy with the shape, then you just push it off instead of pull it off. That's kind of amazing. amazing. <laughs> and then you could just magic. go in and finish up. Marie, your magic. <laughs> I think you're magic. <laughs> <laughs> I do. So what will we do with our little <laughs> our little kiss? I don't know. Definitely a little Christmas. It could be a little boo, right? It could be a little a little ghost. That's yeah, great. For I sure. love that. <laughs> you could do little potted plants in those little mini terracotta um, pots cat. that you get at the <laughs> at the craft store. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Kimberly, so if you were teaching a class, mm -hmm. uh, how would you tell people to sort of know when their piece is dense enough for what you're wanting them to do? That's a really good question. I mean, we did talk about, you know, do you squeeze it and does it come back to its mm -hmm. shape? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's kind of by feel. How would you describe right. it? Um, I always used so my and I've told the story eight million times so people are probably falling asleep. Well, eight million and one because I don't know if I know it. <laughs> well, my husband was a meat cutter when we were younger. Okay. And he once told me that there was a method for testing meat whether it was um, medium, well done, or very well done. It was uh -huh. Sort of like rare. This was if you put these the, your finger and your thumb together and yeah. you press on your thumb here. That's like rare. Oh. This is like medium. This would be well done and that would be very well done. Oh, and so when cool. he told me that a light bulb went off in my head and I'm like, that's how we can well talk done. about. Yeah. Well yeah, done to very you well got done. It. That's it. Because I was, ex was so cool. explained to me that it was like a dry sponge, but I never really equated that with like a true measure, you know, maybe yeah. a new dry sponge or Tennis a used ball. dry sponge, but dry sponge. And now I have this. I love very, that. Well, very I love well that. done. So, yes. but I told Jordan a few weeks ago, I said, man, wouldn't it be great if we could get a pounds for pressure and Jordan came up uh, with she was like yes that can happen uh, because she was taking a glass class I think it was and that was measuring the pounds per pressure so let's look at that for fun real quick 
Okay, so this is what um, Jordan shared with me. And we have this little snail here that was felted by a friend from one of our kits and gifted to us. Um, and he's very, very old, but he's also very, very, you know, squishy compared to some of the things we've shared today. So if we zero out our scale and then we um, compress him, you can see that with very little uh, pressure, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you know, he's kind of getting misshaped with very little pressure. And on the scale, I'm only using about a pound of pressure. So okay. if I press like six, five to six pounds of pressure, he's really distorted. Now right. he does come back, but he's very squishy, you know? Yes. And you couldn't add a lot of detail to something like that. This would be a great example of things that would cave in if, if we were trying to put it. a face mm -hmm. on it. Right, right. So then if we look at something like, you know, Mr. Frog Prince here, let's zero him out. Now with him, I can press, like I am really pressing. So there's seven pounds of pressure. That's maybe that's as, just as strong as my thumb is. <laughs> seven pounds it's sounds not pretty all, good for a it's thumb. It's not all that strong. <laughs> and he's not distorting at all. So right. there's like almost 10, can I go to 10, 10, 10 pounds of pressure. Can, can you do it, I that? believe in you. I did it. <laughs> Hold on, here we go, like 10 pounds of Pressure, 10, 12, 15. And this guy is not distorting at all. He's holding his shape. Yes. Strong bullfrog. So that's an example. Now, I don't know what's the right number. Let's try this little guy. So this is our little uh, jingle and jangle. Mouse. is our little <laughs> uh, Christmas ornament uh, project and kit. And he's actually pretty dense for a little guy. You can mm -hmm. squish the heck out of him. So let's see what happens. So he weighs a third of Mr. Bullfrog, right? right? He's little, but what happens if I give him 10 pounds of pressure? And eight to 10 pounds of pressure, and he's not distorting at all. My fingers are getting strained, but right. <laughs> he's holding up. That's a cool and trick. So, yeah, I don't know what that right amount of pressure is, mm -hmm. you know, but if you can put 10 pounds of pressure on something, I would say that's very well done. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you know, somewhere, it's somewhere <laughs> right there. around like that. there that he'll hold up. So I like those methods. I like your tennis ball method, too. I think that's really good. It's subjective, but it, it works. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> That's all we have for this time. And thank you so much, Kimberly, for having a little hangout with me. Oh, I loved sharing. it. I yeah. loved it. Thanks for having me. Me too. I love learning something new. I learned me something too. new today. Super fun. And we'd love to hear what your ideas are. Like if you have another way that you get really firm sculptures to start, definitely share them in the comments down below. If you want to see more with Miss Kimberly here, we have a great interview with her right up here. And you can take her classes in our online school, feltingtutorials.com. The Busy Elves, such a gas, fun <laughs> class. And wait till you see what the other students have made. And then fall 2023, extreme faces. You gotta make one. I know you're gonna have a great time. Thanks y'all, have a great time. Bye-bye.